Welcome to The Kill Count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Slumber Party Massacre 3, released in 1990. Whereas the first film was a sly send-up, and the second was a literal fever dream, the third Slumber Party Massacre is a mostly traditional slasher sequel. And in fact, when it was made, it wasn't even going to be part of the Slumber Party franchise. It was shot as a completely unrelated film called Nightlight, and only became part of the sequel series when they changed its name upon release. Just like the first two films, Part 3 was written and directed by women, which is why the series is often referred to as the only slasher franchise entirely written and directed by women. And listen, I'm just stating these things as facts, okay? Just so you know, I haven't been trying to be more political or whatever while covering this series, but kill counts have been delving into behind the scenes stuff for quite some time now, and it just so happens that a lot of the production info for these movies involves discussing topics like gender and nudity in film. We should be able to talk about those things in an open and civil way without people of any opinion getting pissed off or being disrespectful. I just hope that's something we can all take away from these episodes. Unfortunately for Slumber Party 3, director Sally Madison was not a horror fan and didn't even want to make a horror movie. She just wanted to direct a feature and took the first opportunity she got from Roger Corman. For me, it was just, you know, let's get through this. So I was very focused, but I still enjoyed it. It was fun. And so we wound up with the most by-the-numbers film of the series, with a lot of moments basically identical to ones we've already seen here. Unlike the first two films, though, this one's a bit of a whodunit at first. But don't you worry, the killer still uses a drill. And I won't have to self-censor any of those drill kills thanks to NordVPN, our faithful Kill Count sponsor. NordVPN encrypts your online activity with a single click of a button and can even make websites think you're connecting from an entirely different country. Hey everybody, it's me. Obviously. After I filmed the rest of this episode, I was informed that NordVPN recently had a security breach, which, you know, is not great. But the cool thing is that Nord themselves actually wanted me to address this breach in the ad, and they didn't want me to pretend like it never happened or anything. The good news is that despite the security incident, no user information was exposed, and in response to the whole thing, Nord's no longer going to be using third-party servers. So they responded, they reacted, and they've been open about the whole thing. If you want, you can read more about it in the link in the description. Description. Okay, back to the previously filmed stuff. It's available for Windows, Mac, iOS, Android, pretty much all the operating systems you use every day. So go to nordvpn.com slash deadmeat to get 70% off a three-year plan, and use the code deadmeat to get an extra two months free. That's nordvpn.com slash deadmeat, promo code deadmeat, for 70% off and an extra two months free. How many characters will end this film in a permanent slumber? Let's find out and get to the kills. The movie begins by looking like a home video of your aunt and uncle's beach vacation. Seriously, is this an actual movie or what? It is, unfortunately, and as you probably could have guessed, it's got a bunch of sexy teens as its characters. I'll name them as needed while we go through the film, cause it's not like they've got personalities we need to know about or anything. For now, I'll just point out our final girl, Jackie, who I think looks like Taylor Schilling, this goofy side character, Duncan, who all the other kids tease, and a stranger staring at them on the beach, looking kinda like a Nordic hacker. Hope these ladies got that Nord VPN protection. One of Jackie's friends, Juliet, meets a Ken doll looking guy on the beach, coincidentally named Ken, who used to go to their high school where he was on the water polo team. That kind of star athleticism wins him an invitation to the slumber party they're having that night, even though his pickup lines are cheesier than my jokes. Like what I the kids finish up their volleyball game, and on her way home, one of these nothing characters named, uh, let's see, Sarah, I think, gets into her car and is killed by a dude in the back seat after he holds her hands together and drills her through the back. Damn, gonna take one heck of a detailing job to clean that up, guy. The movie wastes a good bit of time with top-down cruising along Ocean Avenue before Jackie gets dropped off at home by her crush, a dude named Matt. Is this guy a painter or something? Why is his hat look like that? I don't know, maybe he just owns a bunch of pet birds. Either way, his possibly dropping filled hat doesn't prevent him from getting a smooch. Hey, what do you say we add a random character to this movie? <laughs> 
Morgan. Morgan? Sure, I guess. He's a tall-ass motherfucker who lives across the street from Jackie, and he tells her he was just inside her home because of the open house her family is having. His creepiness increases as he exhibits atrocious social skills before awkwardly leaving her home, basically screaming at the audience to remember him as a suspect. After a surprisingly nudity-free shower scene, Jackie's finally ready to start this slumber party! The girls immediately get to drinking and dancing, and I mean, you know what to expect by now. It's the same as the other two movies, just without any kind of clever self-awareness. Besides a close-up of Juliet, where it looks like they used a body double, the only character who actually takes her top off here is Maria, played by 90s scream queen Maria Ford. As for the other characters, well, once again, nudity was at the forefront of the casting conversation, and once again, some of the actors strongly insisted they were going to keep their clothes on. And that was just something that entered into the casting process. Immediately it was brought up, and I told my agent, no. There has to be a reason it's not going to be gratuitous if I do nudity. So before we even settled on it and negotiated and all of that, that was put out there right away. I don't recollect that having been an issue. I don't think that my part called for it in this particular film, but there were definitely other parts in other films that did. I mean, that's sort of the appeal for those movies at the time. Not like the other girls would have had any time to get naked, because they're too busy getting attacked by monsters! Arr, 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 arr. Oh shit, is that Freddy from Social Media Asicus? Nah, these are just this movie's bunch of guy friends. Jackie's crush Frank, and these other dudes, Tom and Michael. Jackie kicks them out of her house for being a bunch of joits, but out in their car, the dudes hatch a plan where Frank and Tom will go get apology flowers, while Michael goes back to Jackie's by himself for a, uh, preliminary apology, I guess? It's a dumb convoluted way to get this guy alone, but hey, gotta kill him somehow, right? After the girls won't let him back inside, Michael sees a dude in a creepy fucking mask who takes the house for sale sign and stabs it straight into Michael's chest. Way to close on that one, mystery killer. Also, sucks for the people living in this actual neighborhood since they shot this loud screaming death scene around four in the morning. And hey, quite an interesting tidbit from Michael's actor, Garen Grigsby. My wife uh, was in uh, Friday the 13th Part 7. <laughs> so, um, we, we do movies with numbers in them. <laughs> yes, yes you do. The girls decide to order a pizza, because that's what you do when you're at a slumber party pre-massacre, but due to a little shirt and pie switcheroo, when they answer the door, they find that Duncan dork there is the delivery guy. Ladies? Give it up, Duncan. And in the continuing overlap between Slumber Party Massacre and Friday the 13th cast members, that pizza delivery gal is played by Marta Kober, who played Sandra in Friday 2. You know, the one whose brother ended up looking for her in Friday 4, and whose sex scene was cut because she was underage. She's in this movie to help pad the body count, since the killer chases her down in the middle of the street and drills her to death against the pavement. Nothing too special here, because it's just another drill kill. You know what those look like by now. Back at the house, Jackie and her best friend Diane hear a noise at the window, and, thinking it's Michael, decide to try and scare him with a scream. Ah! <laughs> oh no, the beach weirdo's here! Having found where Jackie lives from an address book she dropped on the beach. Jackie calls the cops to report the creeping Tom, but the officer there not only looks a little like Sergeant Mooney from Killer Clowns, but acts like him too, and dismisses her call as frivolous. Honestly, the only reason these cops are included in this movie at all is to set up a shoehorn motivation for the killer later on, which involves another cop who died of suicide a while back, uh, possibly because he was gay? Supposed to be, uh, kind of, uh... Cream Jiminy Cricket, man, that's no reason to kill yourself. Weird. If we're gonna have more massacre in our slumber party, this movie needs some more meat. So it's a good thing the guy friends are back now with their apology flowers. And hey, don't forget about that Ken dude from the beach, who's also just arrived to take Juliet up on her invitation. Frank's flowers earn him a makeup makeout, and other couples start getting romantic too. That Tom guy and this Susie gal have a scene where they get to act like real people. 
people for a bit, which is cool, before making out in front of a swordfish, which is also cool. Susie is played by Maria Claire, and hey, guess what movie she was in right alongside Slumber Party 2's Heidi Kozak? Yep, friggin' society. It's basically beckoning me to cover it. Meanwhile, Ken and Juliet advance from staring into each other's eyes to motorboating in a flash. I don't believe in wasting any time, do you? Life is short. Can't argue with that. But they move a bit too fast or something, since it looks like Ken's having some problems and is not feeling up to the task right now. He still does what he can for her, though, and afterward, Juliet goes to shower off, stopping only to admire Jackie's hidden tools of pleasure. That vibrator actually winds up being the end of Juliet, because after she climbs into the tub, the killer tosses the toy in after her, and Juliet is electrocuted to death. This must be why today's sex toy are generally wireless devices. Ken returns to the others and lies to them, saying he and Juliet were definitely not having sex. Maria knows better, though, and goes to get all the juicy details, only to find Juliet's body all vacuum-sealed in the closet. She shows everyone else the corpse, and they all get freaked out by it, especially Ken. Just stuffed in a garment bag in the closet! The kids go downstairs and call the cops again, but Mooney's gonna Mooney, and their police report remains unfiled. Ken says he has an ex-cop uncle who lives nearby, so he and Tom arm themselves with fire pokers and shovels and head outside to make a run to him for help. Before they get there, they decide to break into an old steel mill to upgrade their flimsy weapons. Ooh, a sledgehammer. What do you think about that, Ken? It's perfect. <laughs> Holy shit, guys, Ken is the mystery killer! Isn't that exciting, guys? Uh, guys? Ken and Tom have a lengthy and actually entertaining construction site brawl until Ken kills Tom by taking a chainsaw to his ankles and amputating his feet off screen. It's weird, though. The last time we see Tom, he's still alive and starting to crawl away. But I'm just gonna count him as dead. This is a slasher, so these people only exist to get killed. Realizing that there's a window in the basement, Jackie and Frank head down there in order to lock it up. They do indeed find the window wide open, because earlier, that weirdo from the beach climbed through it for some reason. Hey, whatever happened to that guy anyway? Oh, he's dead in this chest from a, uh, I don't know, a thing in his mouth. Damn, that dude was the most blatant red herring I've ever seen. Well, I guess second most blatant, after Morgan, the awkward neighbor. Because earlier, that guy was shown spying on the girls through a telescope, and reading a book about human anatomy. On his way back to the house of future victims, Ken stops inside his murder van, which he's put a lot of time into making feel like a murder home. All those mood candles weren't cheap, you know. It's in this warehouse of evidence on wheels that Ken's motivation is revealed, after he pulls out the same newspaper clipping about the cop who died of suicide that we saw in the police station earlier. Uncle? This is for you. Yeah, apparently that cop was his uncle, and he's killing people as revenge for his suicide? I don't know, man. You're not gonna be able to make me care about this killer. I mean, look at him. He's a total fucking goober. Ken gets back to the house and immediately gets to work by killing Duncan with a bunch of drill slashes to the stomach. Aw, oh, come on, Ken. That's not even Duncan's shirt, dude. Although you did already kill the chick who owned it, so no harm, I guess. Morgan spies the ensuing fight through his telescope, and when he calls the police, he's actually taken seriously and even called sir, because the sergeant doesn't think a man would make a dummy out of him. Frank physically engages with Ken in order to protect the girls, but even though Jackie tries to help out, Ken still manages to trip Frank and hit him in the face with his drill. Wait, why'd the kill graphics come on screen? That couldn't have killed him. You killed him! Oh, what the fuck? Ken chases after the girls, occasionally uttering corny-ass lines. Was it something I said? Be nice to uncle girls. And because he somehow locked all the doors and windows, the girls find themselves trapped inside the house with him and his stupid face. You're not being nice. Fuck you! <laughs> 
<laughs> wow. Looks like this Janine girl would rather kill herself than hear anything else this asshole has to say. Although, to Ken's credit, he does make sure she's dead, since we see her later with some extra drill holes in her body. I didn't really see a reason to mention Janine before her death, but I will now note that actor Hope Marie Carlton, a former Playmate of the Month, was previously on the kill count in Nightmare 4, where she was the pinup girl in Joey's room who appeared in his waterbed shortly before his death. How's this for a wet dream? And props to Miss Carlton, who apparently did her own stunt when she went through that window. There was no way it could have been anyone else because you saw me through the plate, you know, glass window come through and land right in front of the camera. So it had to be me, and I liked doing stuff like that. I was very much a tomboy, so that was right up my alley. Susie is hiding in a closet when Ken just ups and Michael Myers himself through the door. He screams in her face and has a very uncomfortable scene wherein he attacks her with his sexual frustration and possibly implies that his uncle raped him. I'm your uncle. In fact, in the unrated version, there's an additional line that spells it out even further. I don't know what they were trying to say between this, the sergeant's earlier comments about Ken's uncle, and Ken's impotence with Juliet, but obviously they're implying something. Maria thankfully breaks up this awful scene with a vase, but before she and the others can escape through the kitchen window, Ken stops them for a kitchen floor wrestle round. Susie comes back downstairs and uses a bucket full of bleach to blind Ken, which is pretty great, but he still lands a drill swipe on Maria that takes her to the ground. The the most controversial scene of the movie begins as Maria grows desperate for her life and offers up the only thing she has left. You can touch me. That's what you want. The result is very uncomfortable to watch and is made more disgusting when you learn that it wasn't even in the original cut of the film. In the original script, she's killed very quickly with no dialogue at all. It was added later during reshoots and not by the choice of director Sally Madison. I believe, I, I recall that we were basically told to do that, you know, the, and I think the reason was that the film was running short. Maybe that's why it goes on for so damn long, but wow does it suck. So much so that Madison herself can't stand it. I watched the film, that scene with Maria is the one that makes me feel the most uncomfortable. Um, because it so clearly ties together the sexuality and the violence against women, and I don't like that. I didn't like it then. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's, you know, not not the thing that I'm the most happy about. The scene finally ends when Ken kills Maria by putting his drill through her stomach. Ken screams out in anger since he can't see any of the girls. Where the fuck are you? So he attempts to even the playing field by knocking out all of the lights. There's a bit of blind battling by the fireplace, but eventually, after Ken gets Diane to the ground and stabs her a whole bunch of times, Jackie kills the driller killer with his own damn drill. Good for her. And she doesn't make the usual slasher mistake either. She keeps going till that guy's dead. Like, really dead. Unfortunately, his stab attack proves lethal for Diane, who dies on the ground right after Ken does. Well, holy goddamn, I almost felt something there, with Jackie's best friend just barely not surviving. The movie ends with Jackie finding the picture of Ken's abusive uncle and the cops knocking at the door, finally ready to take them seriously. A bit late there, fellas. How many one dimensional Dimensional meat bags got drilled to death at our final slumber party? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Wait, what the? Oh, really? A warm glass of water? Very funny, guys. Now I piss myself. Thanks. I gotta go do the numbers. I pee all over myself. Thanks. This is hazing. 12 people died in Slumber Party Massacre 3, and with 6 guy and 6 girl victims, this movie continues the franchise's trend of having pretty damn equal pie charts. With a runtime of 76 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 6 and a third minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Juliet, cause it's not every episode I get to count a death by dildo. Dual machete for lamest kill will go to Frank for sure. Killed by a blow to the head? You're holding a drill, dude. Use it! And that that's it. 
Slumber Party Massacre 3 came out in 1990 and is yet another example of how dried up slashers had become by the end of the 80s. Now, next week is another slasher, but with less slumbering teenagers and more furry animatronics. Cause we're looking at the Banana Splits movie! But until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. Thanks a lot for watching The Kill Count for Slumber Party Massacre 3. I want to thank some patrons like Zion, Harry Bowyer, Taylor Davidson, Mike Triolet, Logan Ballard, and Daryl slash Punk Uke 9. And another thanks to NordVPN for sponsoring this episode. And that's it for the Slumber Party Massacre series, which I'm sure all of you really loved, right? Be good people.